may ask, um, can, can people, can people read what's on the screen there? It's, it seems it's a little small in my looking, which is why I asked Anne to, there we oh, go. Oh, that's better. Okay. Better, better, better. Awesome. Okay, excellent. Um, as my, um, as my consulting practice evolved, several, several things happened and particularly after the pandemic, um, foundation funders in particular, but also nonprofit organizations that previously would sole source me as a consultant went to an RFP process um, in part for um, diversity, equity, inclusion reasons, which is terrific. I mean, certainly terrific for them, terrific for, um, for folks who previously might not have had access to these uh, business opportunities to have access to them. But of course, what that did for people like me, whose work was almost entirely referral, it meant that even those things that I was likely to be um, the, the very a strong or the strongest contender for, I was going to end up writing an RFP um, response. Um, and as all of you know, who have done RFP responses, uh, actually another digression, I am um, an active member of something called the Nonprofit Consultants Network, which is a, um, a network of a broad based network of uh, consultants in the Boston area. And we regularly have conversations about RFPs because this is not just an issue for evaluators, it's an issue for consultants across the board. And the first time we had one of these sessions, it was an in-person session in the before times, um, there were folks who do events or folks who do you know, other sort of more one-off um, and short range types of, um, uh, types of work. And when I was at a table with them describing the fact that I can put in three, four, five days sometimes responding to an RFP, they were like completely aghast. Like it never happens to them, right? They get, you know, um, they get a statement of work or something of that sort. They pick and choose from the stuff that they already have put together. Uh, they respond in two hours and that's it. Well, that's obviously not the way that RFPs are usually going to work with, um, uh, with and for us. We can have another conversation or a later conversation about why I think and I urge clients to do an, a risk, um, uh, an RFQ, um, a request for quotation or for qualification instead of an RFP. I think that is actually um, a better way for the clients and certainly far more respectful for us. Thus far, folks aren't listening to that. <laughs> um, so um, uh, through my lovely friend, Anne, several months ago, I started working with a, um, a terrific business coach in, um, uh, who is located uh, in Portland, Oregon. And among the things that, that I was discussing with her early on is this issue of, of RFPs and how much time they take to respond to and not being, you know, not being sure whether if I, um, you know, do two, three, four days, it makes sense to be doing it, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, oh, well, how about um, developing a decision matrix so that you have a better idea or you have a, you have a more grounded idea of whether you should in fact be pursuing a particular RFP. And of course, you know, data evidence, right? I mean, that's, that's, you know, right up the evaluator alley. And so I said, sure, how does one do that? She provided me with um, several blog posts, just uh, examples, you know, from the web and from uh, practice that she knew. And then um, I sat down one Sunday, quiet Sunday afternoon, and just um, took a look at these models and then added sort of my own stuff. That is what you're going to see on the screen. And I put my, uh, you can see my email there, put it in the chat. I'm happy to, um, if you want to um, pop me uh, a, an email um, after this, happy to, um, to send you a copy of this. Um, what, uh, what I have done is I have made 
the models that you might see if you were to noodle around the web, um, somewhat less um, complicated in terms of like the scoring. I mean, sometimes, you know, the models will have, uh, you know, one through five points. That to me does, wasn't meaningful. A three point, three point scale was um, about, about what we, about what I thought was uh, going to be valuable. Um, I have now used this, uh, I'm going to say two, two, three times um, with colleagues that I am thinking of pitching an, um, an RFP with. And I would say it's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty decent tool. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a solid tool. Um, it's better than the alternative, which, you know, my alternative was guessing. Um, but it is a work in progress. So one of the reasons why I was really excited to be here when Anne approached me and said, um, would you want to, um, to talk to this, to this group is um, I would love your feedback um, about what resonates with you, what doesn't resonate with you, and uh, you know, how we might um, want to make it, um, uh, how I might want to make it better, better tool. So I will start stop there and see if there are thoughts or questions and if there aren't then what i will do is i will just sort of ping through the um the various uh factors yes um i was actually going to ask a question about one of the factors so if you're going to talk through them i will give you space to do that first before we jump into the question okay great <laughs> uh, let's do i'm gonna i'm just gonna do i'll do the first four factors my lovely friend Anne is manning the meters here. Um, so I will do the first four factors, then I'll stop, and then we'll see if there are questions on those, then we'll proceed. Does that, that, does that work for folks? Okay. Um, current relationship with the client, uh, you know, uh, that's obviously key. All of us know this. You're far more likely to be getting, um, to be getting a successful uh, success in RFP or success in any business if you have a prior relationship with a client. Um, number of additional competitors bidding. Um, uh, one thing that I don't have in here, I'm so glad I'm talking to you guys. One thing that I do not have in here is um, I make a point of never bidding an RFP unless there is a bidders conference or I can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, the, um, with whoever is um, issuing the RFP. If they're not going to talk with anyone, then, um, uh, then I don't then that's an indication to me that it's going to be a difficult relationship and I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to play. I do every time I um, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or if I participate in a bidder's conference, I ask how many other folks are bidding. Obviously, um, not obviously, uh, often um, you are going to have a better time if you are one of the few bidders than if you are one of dozens. Known competitor's relationship with a client. I, I will not go into the the you know the awful situation that I had um, in the spring where I would have gotten I would have been a successful respondent to an RFP except for the fact that I introduced to the client the people <laughs> that they eventually took. Not going to do that again, but. Um, to the extent that you that you can figure this out, that's sort of self um, uh, self evident. Um, appropriateness of the fee structure. Um, this is obviously a very very big one, and as all of you will probably know, if you've worked with nonprofits or with foundations, and that's my entire arena. That's those are that's the four squares of my client base. Um, sometimes the clients don't have don't know how to cost. Other times they are unwilling to pay what it's worth. Um, this is obviously a, I mean, there may be other reasons why you want to do it, even though it's a, um, even though the fee structure is not appropriate, um, but um, this, and we can go into those if you'd like, but this is, you know, obviously kind of high on the list. So I'm gonna stop there, see if there are questions about any of these. Me, me, yeah. me, me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is like already like so valuable. It never would have occurred to me to ask, duh, how many other people are bidding. And I'm really curious about how you came to the idea that you don't even like think about it if they A, don't have a bidder's call or B, won't take a call with you. Um, so I don't know if you can 
enlighten us on how you kind of came to that? Like, yeah, I will. And then I'm going to go to Vishaka and then to Jason. Um, how did I come to this? Well, there are just some things that you need to know. I mean, you need to know, is this, and again, remember, I'm talking the four squares of nonprofit and foundations where the RFP is likely malleable, right? Um, there may, there's, it, very often there is, um, there's room for creativity in that if you're going for, if there's a government project, university project, it may be a very different thing. But here there is some room for, for malleability um, often. And um, I want to take the measure of the person who is, who I'm gonna be working with. Uh, that relationship is obviously really critical as Anne and others of you know. Um, and um, also there just are almost inevitably, even with the best RFP, um, there are going to be questions that you have. It's just too much of a, it's just far too much of a black box um, for uh, to, um, you know, to take the plunge unless somebody will talk to you. I don't know if that, that's satisfying or not. And but. so, and so if there isn't um, a bidder's call, do you then email like whoever's putting the, the proposal out there, whoever the contact person is and say, hey, would you be willing to have a conversation to talk about the proposal? Or I have a Ab few questions. Is that how you do that? Ab absolutely. And you, and you also want to, you want to say, um, uh, I, I mean, this is the way that I approach it. You say, um, I want to make sure that I am being as responsive as I can be. Uh, you know, as helpful as I can be in the response. In order for me to do that, I need to ask a few clarifying questions. Can we get on the phone to do that? Um, I will take 20, 25 minutes of your time. That last piece is very important because, uh, you know, most, most of the time people don't want to talk with you. So if you say to them 20, 25 minutes, then you really do lead with, you know, if there are substantive questions, you lead with them very quickly. Um, and, um, you know, just co sort of be very respectful of their time, bang, 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 bang. Um, I have yet to have that completely turned down. I've had people do it very grudgingly, um, but, um, you know, that's the way that I say it. It will benefit you. You will get a better response from me if I have an interaction with you. So can we talk for 20, 25 minutes? Thank you. Vishaka? Hi, yeah, so I have a question about the, the additional competitors bidding situation as well. So um, how do you, how did they know the number of people who are bidding unless they've received all the applications already? I think I have definitely been interested in RFPs and then sent them in. I'm sure there might be people who are interested but don't send in an application. Um, so I'm just curious as to how we would expect the, the nonprofit to know who's even interested. My experience is that most of the time people have their preferred vendors okay. and their friends have preferred vendors. And so when they're putting out the RFP, they may post it on their website, they may post it to LinkedIn, and then they post to, and then they email specifically to half a dozen, a dozen, it depends on how big the RFP is. Mm -hmm. They go out with, you know, with a specific email to specific people saying, we hope that you'll consider this. Mm -hmm. um, and if, you know, if somebody sends me an email saying, we hope you consider this, my, my immediate reaction is to eyeball it very quickly and email them back saying, so interesting, have to look, you know, on, uh, you know, with a five second um, review of it seems quite promising, blah, 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 love me, right? Mm -hmm. um, so whoever's putting out the RFP is going to have gotten that sort of level of response it's not a science, it's not mm -hmm. scientific. And again, if you are putting out a much, much bigger, um, uh, you know, if you are entering a much bigger government, university, whatever else, where the bidders could be dozens, it's very well maybe a different thing. But if it's a nonprofit, if it's a foundation, uh, generally they'll have an idea. Okay, thank you. Jason was next. Yeah, I have a few questions, but I guess though, I didn't quite get the example about the known competitors relationship. 
Um, what I heard was your relationship with another competitor, not the relationship between the competitor and the client. It's that. It's the it's the it's the latter. What you want to know is what the relationship. I I, I will get to farther down the list the relationship between. Uh, well, I mean that is actually no. It's right on the top. Okay, so the first thing is how how close are you to the client. The second thing is who do you, who do you know that the client also knows, uh, and that the client is inclined to um, is inclined to hire. If the client is inclined to hire, um, you know her college roommate, her you know husband's best friend, her this, her that, then the bar that you have to meet is for value is way higher than sure. if you know. Yeah, the example you gave, though, you said I introduced them to the competitor. And so, oh, OK, so I'll, I'll just give a five second thing. So the so new consultant, I am bidding on a this is a weird this was a weird situation uh, foundation. I had done some work for a foundation, gotten kudos for it. Great reviews. Uh, that's year one. Year two. Um, a uh, person uh, who I had vaguely known becomes an independent consultant. Year three, the client comes back and has an RFP. When I do my bidder meeting with the, with the client, I mention to the client that this, this consultant is now you know, out there doing interesting work. The consultant turns out to have been a former colleague of the clients. Oh, okay. if, if I had dug a little deeper, I would have, I, I mean, I, I knew that they had both worked for an organization. It was years and years removed, had no idea that they had an actual relationship. Turns out they did have an actual relationship and sort of, you know, the rest was history. But that's, that's anomalous. I don't think that's gonna happen very often. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Hopefully. Sherilyn. Um, yeah, so I was kind of curious around, so I think one of my fears is applying to RFPs where people already like, they just released it because they had to release it, but they, and they already know who they're gonna work with. Um, yeah, and so how do you gauge that type of thing? And maybe that's something that you're able to gauge when you're in conversation, when you have those conversations with them. Yeah. Uh, um, yes, and it's actually farther down on the list. So um, I will come. I will come back to that once we get there on the list, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, definitely. That's totally fine. And then okay. I have another question. Sure. Um, keep going, and then I'll come back to it. Yeah. Okay. So um, Anne, if you could, mm -hmm. if you could scroll so that we're at, um, so that row uh, sixteen is at the top. Perfect. Um, Oh, yeah. So, Sherilyn, you'll see this on, on row 19. That was your question. Um, but I'm going to, I'll ping through 16 through 19 now. So, quality of the RFP, um, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, if, in fact, they have um, good thinking going into the RFP, that is some small indication that they may have good thinking um, coming out. Um, in other words, they, they, they may be professional and thoughtful to work with. Now, it's not, I mean, this is why it's only one of, you know, a couple of dozen uh, criteria. I have had this happen both ways. I've had professional RFPs mean that working with a client um, works really well because they're organized and thoughtful and they really know what they want. I've also had even probably more situations in which the RFP was done by an outside consultant or by their internal evaluation team, and um, the RFP itself is good, but their you know their internal stuff is is just nowhere near it. But so it's one of it's one of those items that I take into account. Certainly, a professional, thoughtful RFP um, is often less. Uh, complicated and less time consuming to respond to. So, you know, that sort of fits into the mix. Reputation of the client's uh, implementation team. 
you know, there are those people who um, are um, have just a terrific program, very, very interesting, you know, doing awesome work out there in the community and are just too much, um, just too much of a struggle to work with. Um, and if you know the, if you know the arena, or if you can, if you have friends who know the arena, or, you know, you can make some confidential um, inquiries among, uh, you know, colleagues, uh, th that's among the many reasons why AEA is a is a great resource. Um, and you find out that this is an organization that is one of those that can really save you huge, huge, huge headaches. Uh, timing, that's almost self-explanatory, you know, is um, somebody who is someone who is thoughtfully doing an RFP puts it puts the RFP out at least four weeks before the RFP is due and then at least eight weeks before you have to start the project. But that doesn't always happen. And again, it's it's some of some of that is just a practical thing. Can you scramble to get it done? Some of it's also a, a an indicia of professionalism. Like are these people actually really thinking ahead? And then we're getting to Sherilyn's question, is this a real solicitation or are they looking to be educated or to validate their choice? Um, this is a, um, this, depending on the market, um, you can, you can develop, uh, you can develop intuition about this over time if your market is small enough. So if you are working in, a, in an arena or in a geographic location or with a set of organizations where there may be you know, three, four, five consultants, pretty soon you will get to know what the, um, uh, what the mechanisms are, what the overall design is, uh, design preferences are of your competitors, right? If, uh, if an RFP comes across and, the design looks exactly like the way that your competitors implement these projects, then you can be pretty sure that um, either the competitor was involved in designing the RFP or that the competitor, is, that, that they have pretty much decided to hire the competitor and they just wanna know whether you can do the competitor's model better. Um, or less costly, sometimes that's, sometimes that's the other thing. So, um, uh, again, this is just not a, um, this is why you want to be either in a bid conference or on the phone um, with the, um, uh, with whoever the commissioner of the, of the evaluation or the measurement learning work is. If in fact they are eager to talk with you, eager to be on the phone, happy to be answering your questions, answering your questions thoughtfully, then even if you don't know them, um, chances are that it's a real solicitation. If any of those things is not true, oh, you know, dragging their feet and responding, don't really want to talk with you, um, aren't so, you know, haven't really thought through the questions, et cetera, then you do have to think, you know, maybe they just need three bids and, um, and you know, that can be kind of an indication. Does that, Sherilyn, is that helpful? Do you have a follow up? Um, yeah, that's really helpful. And then follow up to that, um, recently there's, it's actually more of an RFQ and, um, and so it's, it's like really, really short kind of like, you know, what are you, are you qualified for this project kind of deal? And of course I have tons of questions about it, but if it's an RFQ, then it doesn't really feel like all of the questions are actually necessary to bring to them. And so I'm curious in that sort of in that situation, when you want to talk to them, would it be more about kind of like partner, like partnership style and working style rather than um, what exactly the evaluation would look like? Yeah, I think if it, um, and I haven't had as much experience um, with RFQ in my evaluation um, uh, life as, as um, I have, uh, you know, in my um, lives before that. Um, I would think with an RFQ, you want to have, you want to get a feel for the client. Are they flex, you know, uh, if you can kind of bounce stuff off of them, are they flexible about, you know, doing it this way, doing it that way? Uh, are they very rigid in terms of methodology? 
um, then that's going to be um, an indication. Or are they really thinking, because with an RFQ, the important thing is how are you going to be co-designing the project with the client? Mm -hmm. right? That's what you want to know. You want to know, is the client going to be amenable of co-design? And if they are, do they have really, you know, are there really sort of strict um, criteria? Do they absolutely have to have uh, a quantitative piece of this, even if it doesn't make, even if quant doesn't make sense, for example, right? Um, those sorts of things you can get in a conversation with an RFQ. The other thing about the RFQ is, um, and this is obviously critical and probably self-evident, is that if, if they, if you talk with them and they want, um, they have 20,000 bucks to spend and they want $70,000 worth of work, um, then, you know, right there, that's the, that's a tell. Those are two things I can think of. Thank you. Shall we move on? Folks. That kind of connects to Leonora's question I'm seeing in the chat about how much work or information they ask for in advance. I don't know if you see that, but I think that's a that's definitely a thing. And I'll just respond and say I've blown pretty good opportunities by bringing up intellectual property, but I think that there's a there's a less intense way to avoid doing a lot of work for people or sharing too much. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I was trying to get that in and mumbling through my my mute button was on. So yeah, and I've had kind of a similar experience. And I'll let you speak to that, Kathleen. But I know someone um, recently has started, uh, and Susan has adopted, Susan Wolf has adopted this too, where on the proposal, she says something about, you know, uh, if it calls for somewhat of an evaluation design, she, she has kind of a disclaimer that, you know, they understand that this is part of the proposal and not to be used outside of the proposal. So Kathleen, you're the That's attorney. Exactly I'll let yeah, you no, speak to that. <laughs> no, no, that's exactly what I would say is that I think that you should, I mean, you know, people may feel kind of weird about, you know, about miffing the client by suggesting that they might want to use um, somebody's proprietary process uh, without paying for it. But um, I, I think you have to, I think you do have to have I think you should, if if you are in fact giving a detailed account of what you are going to do, I do think that you have to have a disclaimer, a line of disclaimer saying, um, you know, we're providing you with this information, but it is purely for purposes of of this bid. I mean, we own this, and it's purely for purposes of this bid. Lenore, does that answer your question? You can put it in the chat if you need to. Right. Should we um, should we move up in and put uh, line 20 at the top? And I'll just start here. Um, our expertise, you know, again, um, sometimes you bid on stuff in which you just um, you sometimes you bid on a project because you think that you can bring enough value and it's an you're um, introducing yourself, you have a fresh approach, you have a fresh team, you have a team with interesting background <clears throat> that the client might actually really want to um, work with. Um, so there's, you know, there's reasons to not only bid on something that where you absolutely know that you've, that you're a leader, um, but it is definitely something, per particularly if there's, if you know that there's going to be sort of you know, tight turnaround. It's something that you want to be keeping in mind is your level of expertise for doing it. Uh, capacity to accomplish the project, sort of similar <clears throat> idea, you know, can you do it um, again, you know, with timing, can you do it with existing people? Do you have people in your, in your stable of um, colleagues, uh, you know, around the country um, or around your community that you can also bring to bear? That can be a, um, uh, that can be a, that can be an issue as well. Um, Lenora, let me get back to you in just a second. How much existing, um, existing RFP content can we use? 
Uh, you know, that also self-explanatory, if, um, if you can pick and choose from stuff you've already written, then it's going to be easier to respond. <clears throat> um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, um, whether the, whether the time is, is worth the money. I mean, if it's an incredibly interesting, intricate, um, proposal, but the money is going to be very, uh, very limited, then you do actually want to be thinking about, um, you want to be thinking about uh, that very carefully. <clears throat> Do we have questions about that? And then I'll go back to Lenore's um, intervention. We good on this? So let me see what Lenore said. When you do find that organizations used your work, what are some possible general scenarios that you recommend? Um, well, I think it depends on how much, uh, I mean, there's the, I, th th I think that's a longer conversation which I would be happy to have. Let me just ping through a couple of things. The, um, I think for most situations, um, you, the, most situations, the best first thing to do would be to reach out to the, whoever commissioned the evaluation and have a phone conversation in which you say, um, this looks, you know, I, it, it seems to me that my confidential um, or, you know, my proprietary process may have been used um, in this work tell me, um, you know, can we have a conversation about that? Um, you know, if I'm wrong, I'd love to be, um, you know, I'd love to be corrected. Um, I think, and this is, uh, I'm a lawyer by background. This is not legal advice. This is, but this is kind of in a, in a way putting on my lawyer hat. Um, I think you probably don't want to have that in writing initially, but I, but I, um, the, I think the first thing to do is to, you know, was there a misunderstanding? Is this something that you got from somebody else? Just to put people on notice that what they did is um, not okay. I mean, sometimes it's, this is similar to plagiarism, right? People will adopt stuff without even really realizing that they, you know, that they got it from um, a location or a, a source that actually owns it. Um, so sometimes it's just a, a it's just a miscommunication, and I think I would start there, all the way, you know, leveling up to, um, you know, um, you could have your lawyer write your business lawyer write a letter saying, um, you know, my you use my client stuff. This is not cool, um, and uh, so there, there's there's many gradations. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, we could have a longer conversation about it offline. Feel free to get a hold of me. But I would say um, start with just, you know, getting a face to face conversation with um, whoever you think is responsible for it and ask them. By the way, if it's another consultant that used it, <clears throat> I would still start with a client um, and say, um, you know, tell me, tell me what's going on here. Um, at, uh, answering um, Jason's question, do you have a criteria about um, dollar amount specified or not? Jason, say another sentence about that, please. So some RFPs have a price tag already attached and some don't. And so you have to, I don't know, I would imagine some people would prefer to know how much money is on the table in advance. And I'm just curious whether that, how that factors into your cost benefit analysis of the time effort being worth it. Oh, it's absolutely, it's absolutely essential. If they won't tell you what their budget is, or at least a budget range, don't bid. Okay. Yeah, I have, believe me, I have made that mistake. Unless they come back, I mean, sometimes what they'll do is they'll say, you know, we don't really know what it costs. Um, tell, you know, give us a range. And what you can do when you have a conversation with them is you can say, from the from my experience, the the what this is going what it's going to cost me to do this project is between X and Y. Does that seem like um, does that seem like an accessible amount to you? Does that seem realistic to you? Um, uh, I'll just tell you one really quick horror story. Um, major national, actually international, um, humanitarian organization is about ten years ago. Um, 
my my then colleague and I knew um, uh, somebody very senior in their organization. We were invited to um, respond to an RFP. It require it would require site visits in five places, focus groups. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of interviewing, you know, digging into their background document review. Um, and so we put together a project plan and it was I don't remember exactly how much it was, but it was, you know, 60, 80,000, something like that. It was, you know, it was not outrageous. Um, we did not ask them what their budget was. When we finally got to talk with them and having done a lot of work um, to respond to the RFP, it turned out that their budget was like $18,000. So what the, and they did end up getting the project done. Now, how did they get the project done? This is an organization which on its board of directors or board of advisors had many, many high level, very qualified, retired foreign service officers, nonprofit executives, blah, 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 blah. Oh my gosh, poor Anne. Yeah, same thing. Um, and um, what I am guessing that what they did is they took our design and somebody did it pro bono. Never make that mistake again. I never made it again. They won't tell you what a range don't bid. Shall, I'm just keeping my eye on the clock. Shall we move on? So we have other questions in the queue. Um, yeah, potential use. So we're starting at 24 here now. Um, potential um, as a precursor for this client, you may, it, depending on how much time it takes to respond to the RFP, you might want to respond just so that essentially, um, as, as Cheryl and several other folks um, were suggesting, you're introducing your you give the you use the RFP as a, a as a method of introducing yourself to the client if you don't have another good way of doing that. It's essentially a way of showing that you have valuable um, expertise. Um, you know, we could have a long conversation about that one. Um, education value of the RFP in the client's ecosystem that is actually similar. So um, if you think that by responding to the RFP, you are going to be teaching the client something about how this project should be done or, and or that the client is going to have colleagues someplace um, who might need similar work for whom this will be an education, foundations regularly share these respond this kind of information with one another, foundation program officers do. They share names of successful and unsuccessful bidders. Um, I know this because I've helped people, I've helped foundations to bid projects. Um, I've designed bidding processes for them, for them to run. So, you know, there may very well be an education uh, value and then it becomes a question of whether the other um, criteria match. Um, 26 is, 26 is a bit, um, is a bit delicate. Do you need to bid this because this is an important client who, who wants you to bid it and you need to preserve the relationship? Do you need to bid it because your work partner is close to someone you know, related to the organization and you need to preserve her relationship with a client, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I, have, I have done these. In fact, I have one out now. <laughs> so um, again, you know, in the in the sort of larger set of of uh, criteria, um, overall benefit of the of the project. That one is a little bit. That one's a little bit amorphous. Um, that's kind of like, you know, do we actually think that this is going to be helpful at some point down the line? Questions on these. Otherwise, we'll just go up to the, okay, so this is it. Oh, actually, um, Anne, um, scroll up to the, um, scroll up so that sum of ratings is at the top. No, 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 other way, other way, other way. Down, I'm going to the, I'm sorry, go to the bottom. Bottom below where you were before. Keep going, keep going. Okay, so um, alternatives to filing a response. Um, 
And this is something that I got from some of these blog posts, particularly that what was particularly interesting. And in fact, I have one of these out now with a um, with a big international foundation. Um, the the blog post and information that I was using call this a no bid letter. What this basically means is I am responding to the RFP saying, um, I don't want to do that project. Um, but on the basis of how you describe what you're looking for on the RFP, I think this piece could provide value, or maybe it should be characterized in some other way that would get to where I think you want to go. Or um, uh, my um, uh, uh, very experienced education sector evaluator, friend of mine um, in the Boston area will sometimes get these long RFPs and be asked to respond to them. And she only wants to do one part of the measurement and learning part. And so she will respond and she will say, um, you know, these other things are not, um, uh, are not the sort of uh, work that is really my sweet spot. However, you know, paragraph one sub G, um, you know, I have national expertise on this, would really love to talk with you about, you know, about that. Um, and, um, you know, again, um, that, that could result in really anything. I mean, sometimes what that will do, a no bid letter will do is to get the client to think about their actual RFP and whether it makes sense. I mean, it does occasionally happen that the um, that the client will pull the RFP and go with your process instead. I think rare, but I think occasionally it does happen. The other thing that can happen is that the client could, can also may go to the successful bidder and say, I want to take X percentage of what you what your RFP response but I want Kathleen and her colleague to do this piece that I think that they, where they can provide particular value, which is it difficult? Yes. Is it awkward? Yes. <clears throat> is it always a great idea to agree to that? Maybe not. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, it doesn't hurt to have a, a conversation with the client and the other successful bidder about whether in fact everybody feels that they can you know, work well together. So that is, that's really kind of everything that I have. Do other, do folks have um, observations, comments? I mean, you know, particularly from my standpoint, are there things that, that, um, that we haven't discussed or I haven't talked about that you think would be helpful to have in here? One thing that, oh, go ahead. Do you mind just scrolling up on the screen while Jessica asks her question? Okay, that's good. Thank you. I was I was just gonna mention, and I, I feel like you know, a couple of your your criteria kind of um, touch on this. I find myself considering, in addition to like, is my expertise appropriate for this project? Like, am I a, a good person for this RFP? I feel like my, and of course I up until this point have been doing all these calculations kind of up in my head but rather than um, more systematically like this, which I really love this approach. I do find myself thinking a little bit about, I don't know what you would call it, like a passion or excitement criteria. So not yes. only like, would I do a good yep. job at this project, but how stoked am I about this idea? And like, if, if they came back and said, yes, you know, we're gonna select you for this project. Like, am I excited just because of like, all right, that goes towards my bottom line, or am I really, you know, really excited about the work that they're doing and the impact that, you know, joining um, with this organization could have? And it's tough to quantify. I don't know how I would set up my three different, you know, levels of that, but something that I find myself considering. Yeah, I, is, I, I love that, so, Jessica. I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to stop recording, um, if you sure. don't mind. <laughs>